Committee meeting, March 6th, 2017, to order. Ms. LaBelle Pierce, if you'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. School committee member and student reports. School committee chair report. I have none at this time. Resource committee. Uh, resource committee. Uh, we just had an informational meeting the other day, so I will. We will be scheduling another meeting soon. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. School building needs. Nothing at this time. Policy committee. Uh, we have a policy for a second reading before us. We will be scheduling our next meeting uh, with Marissa and Juana um, probably after the meeting. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Student support. Ms. LaBelle Pierce. Uh, we are looking to March 20th as our next meeting, so more information will come out about that. But we did hold um, a task force meeting last week that came out of the student support subcommittee um, and the task force is around the goal of expanding the instrumental um, instruction and music program throughout all the schools in the district and we're really excited about that um, the meetings are going to continue um, if people think they would like to be involved in a task force about instrumental expansion um, please get in touch with me um, or see the agendas for the student for the, um, that will come out of the student support meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. LaBelle Pierce. Uh, school personnel committee, that's myself, the mayor. We are still in negotiations with the school nutrition group, and those will be continuing. Meeting on the 15th? 15th. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stevens, yes. Executive committee, uh, no report. Student reports. Um, so. In? Oh, uh, uh, Hannah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. Um, on March 2nd was Read Across America Day, and in honor of Dr. Seuss's birthday, um, the Fitchburg High Library gave out five Barnes & Noble prizes, which encouraged a lot of readers. And the winter dance that was supposed to be on March 4th has been canceled. Um, the Fitchburg High 4x2 team placed seventh in the New England meet this past weekend, and the Fitchburg High Ocean Science team uh, went to regionals at MIT this weekend and placed sixth. Wow. Good. 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 Any questions from the committee? Oh, um, there's more. <laughs> um, our student advisory council met this week, and some of the topics we talked about were um, an attendance challenge that started today. Um, so for every student with um, perfect attendance until the end of the challenge, which is until after April vacation, they get five raffle tickets. And then there are a couple incentives for the um, graduating class with the highest attendance every week, um, just as a way to get more raffle tickets for each student. And we got um, a large donation so that we can um, pay for the prizes. It's going to be gift cards to Dunkin Donuts, Marshalls, and then the kind of grand prize is going to be um, two tickets to prom. So everyone is probably going to get to school so they can save $130. <laughs> um, we also talked about possible um, Saturday session changes for the AP classes. And we decided that it was seeming like maybe it would be better just to do the mock exam on the Saturdays instead of the um, Saturday sessions as well. So instead of doing nine sessions a year, we would just do three um, because we find that the mock exam is very helpful, but the other Saturday sessions might not be as effective as we had hoped. Um, and this Saturday, we are offering the SAT at Fitchburg High. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you, ladies. Uh, Approval of the minutes from the previous school committee meeting, February 27, 2017. Make a motion we approve. Motion made to approve. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? It is unanimous. No need for executive session. Communications, Nature's Classroom Field Trip. Yep. This is a proposal for Nature's Classroom. Uh, it's memorial here. No friend. Um, come up and speak to it. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Just a, a follow-up. We had got the initial approval to fundraise and stuff back in the fall. 
So, um, in your packet, you have the uh, clearance for the medical people, that sort of stuff. Um, so, we just like to plan to go ahead. We have um, 42 students right now, but there is still a chance. March 10th is the last day that they can sign up. So, we may get a little bit more than that, but it looks like only one bus, so we're in good shape there as far as not adding to anything as far as transportation costs. So it's a, this is the uh, third year that we've made that trip. Great. Okay. Any questions? Did, Fran, this is only the third year? Yeah, well, really? or third and second. We had done a lot when we were just I was going to say, you've done this for yeah. years. Yeah, when yeah, we were 5'6", right. then when we went to 5'8", it kind of oh, went away. So okay. now we, we're trying yeah. to bring it back. It's a so great that program. A trip. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's mm -hmm. a great program. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions from the committee? Great program. Right. Thank you. We're now at the public comment period. Let me remind individuals who wish to comment that it's a five minute limit. I will keep the time. Anyone wishing to take advantage of the public comment, please come forward, middle table, site, state your name and your address, please. Thank you. David Thibault Munoz, 51 Longwood Avenue, Fitchburg. Hello again. Missed you guys, a few of you last week. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, have an abridged version of what I uh, spoke <coughs> last week just for the folks that weren't here. Um, thank you, uh, Fitchburg School Committee members, Mayor Dean Itali, uh, school administrators, for taking a moment to listen to my concerns tonight regarding the proposed policy to institutionalize canine, random canine searches. I'm speaking to you tonight as a parent of a child who attends Fitchburg Public Schools and as a parent who intends to both have both of his children attend Fitchburg High School. I'm speaking to express my opposition to the proposed policy in question. It's on the table tonight, uh, which I hope you will consider before conducting, conducting a second reading and a final vote this evening. First, regarding Fitchburg High School, there are about a thousand students, maybe a little more than that, uh, but only a handful of drug dealers. We already have a full-time resource officer at Fitchburg High School's sole job it is to police the school. Shouldn't he already know who the suspected dealers are? Two primary roles of that resource officer are to police the school, monitoring and pinpointing suspicious activity, collecting intelligence, Targeting, targeting suspects once there's probable cause to do so. Second, building relationships with each and every student. My experience as an educator has been that when, you, when students trust you, those who are not doing anything wrong will voluntarily give up their peers that are and share information with you that would be helpful to an investigation in any wrongdoing. In a school, this is called ethical school environment. In the community, it's called community policing. Second, random searches will merely disrupt the school day that is already busy, um, getting stuff done and take away from instruction time. Third, why should we treat all students like criminals when there's only a handful of people committing criminal acts? Four, there are two primary reasons why students leave the school district to come to programs like mine, uh, the gateway to, well, the uh, a dual enrollment program. <laughs> um, at, at, in one of them is anxiety related to bullying and in the way that they've been um, disrespected at schools, either by staff or school administrators who treated them at best like children and at worst like criminal suspects. And I don't mean just the ones who are up to no good. Finally, the real epidemic affecting our children these days is prescription pills, which canine dogs cannot sniff out. Shouldn't we be focused more on prevention intervention, not criminalization? Um, and I have two, two recommendations, and then I just wanted to read something from the ACLU. Uh, the first is, uh, when I was a policy committee chair, uh, we eliminated a policy that was published in 1971 uh, that was around, it was, uh, the reason we got rid of it is because there was a lot of stuff in that was dated um, around uh, agencies that don't exist anymore, and just, we, we're, we have a lot more information these days around drugs and addiction. Um, but having something, a policy in there, I think would be helpful to have 
something around identifying addiction, someone who's addicted and, and, and doing something about it and um, referring students. The second is, as a former school committee member, my litmus test for good policy was always to suggest a school-wide student vote in the middle schools and high schools. I would, re and, and to, let's imagine for a moment that everyone in the school is not a criminal suspect, and I would like to respectfully suggest that the table is pro uh, proposed, I mean, sorry, the policy proposed that's on the table tonight uh, be postponed, a vote be postponed until um, students have had an opportunity to decide whether they think it's a good idea and whether or not they think it's something that would make them feel safe. And then finally, I just wanted to read this um, uh, from the ACLU, uh, uh, an article that I read. It says, there are a number of reasons we should be concerned about drug sniffing dogs in schools. But one key problem is that they have not been very effective at targeting only drug possessors. Several studies have indicated that drug dogs are prone to false alerts, which then lead to unjustified searches. Records of drug sniffing dogs in one Washington school district, for example, indicated that dogs were incorrect 85% of the time they, alert, they were alerted to a substance. A Chicago study similarly of drug dogs used for roadside automobile searches shows a 56% uh, error rate, which actually increased the 73% error rate among Hispanic drivers. Further, there is little to no evidence to, to support claims that these programs deter drug use, reduce drug-related crime, or increase perceptions of public safety. This means that these searches are not only costly to individuals who experience embarrassment, humiliation, and anger when they are searched based on false alert, they are also costly to school districts. This is from 2001, but it's, it's, the estimates are uh, $12,000 to $36,000 a year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Jody Boucher. Um, I live at 55 Alamo Dow. Um, I'm actually for um, the canine suites. Um, I have two daughters in the Pittsburgh Public School System. One is in elementary school, and the other is in middle school. We are for it. I've spoken with both of my children who are for it. Um, asked them if they were okay with it. They said it was a little bit scary. Would be a scary, but it was for a good cause. Um, we've lost two people close to us from drug addiction and many more that I've grown up with. I'm 29. The generation that's dying right now is my generation. I've lost a lot of friends and I don't want that to happen to my kids. Um, these people started using drugs at a young age. Maybe if the canine unit was used when we were students, this wouldn't be happening. I can't say 100% that it would have worked, but at least one maybe would have helped. It would have stopped one parent from getting the horrible call that their child died of an OD. I understand many people have voiced their concern on this topic. Many are scared what it will do to their future if they get caught. If we work with our police and our school districts, it could help us figure a way to not get this to ruin their education. Um, we must teach our children how their actions have consequences. If either of my children were caught doing drugs and it would affect their future, me and my husband would be there to help them fix the mistake they made. It would be a lesson and they would need to work really hard to fix it. In the beginning of the school year, parents and children were given a school handbook and all of us had to sign and read it. In the student handbook it states, search and seizure. While students are assigned lockers, locks, desks and tables and etc. For the use, it remains property of the school and subject to inspection at any time. Illegal substances, objects, or evidence of illegal activity or violation of the student discipline code, which are found as a result of such inspection, will result in appropriate disciplinary action. In addition, when reasonable cause exists to believe a student may possess an illegal substance or an object or upon evidence or reasonable suspicion of illegal activity, School personnel may search the student and inspect his or her belongings, including their clothing, backpacks, wallets, bags, purses, etc. Any illegal items or evidence of illegal activity found as a result of the search will be <coughs> confiscated and investigated further, and the student involved may be subject to disciplinary action. If appropriate, the police will be contacted. I myself believe that if we work together um, 
I think if we found a program maybe that if a child was suspected of drug abuse that we put them in a program and we help them and with the dogs coming in I think it would pinpoint I mean if there's a kid who's in high school who is deliberately selling and their lockers loaded yes they're gonna have very big like repercussions and that's just something they're gonna have to deal with and they're gonna have to work really hard to prove that they can do better and maybe get into a program um, but we need to main my main focus is we need to make sure that we educate our children so they don't fall into a life of drug dependency so we're for it thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jim Cragen. I live at 140 Apple Tree Hill here in the city, and I'm a lifelong Fitchburg resident. Um, I'm also a retired high school teacher, uh, taught in the area um, for 35 years. And during my tenure at um, the school that I was at, uh, we had canine searches maybe it occurred two to three times um, during that period. Um, it was very smooth. Um, we were told as teachers to keep the students in the classroom. So at no time during the canine searches were students ever exposed to the dogs in any way. Um, they usually lasted 10 to 15 minutes. We were then told after the dogs were gone from the building um, to remove, continue with our school day. Minimum disruption to the school day. Um, and I think the most important piece was the message to the students that um, the school is going to be safe and drug free. And that's what I'd like to see here for the city of Fitchburg as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Craig. Hey, how's it going? Hello. Hi. My name is Michael Maxwell. I live at 325 Main Street, um, Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Um, This is a very important subject matter for me um, as a resident. And um, I want to say this. In 2017, now that we have legalized recreational marijuana use, the only people that are really going to be identified by these drug sniffing dogs, which pretty much amount to marijuana sniffing dogs, are mostly children of parents who are recreational or medicinal marijuana users. If it's in your home, you're gonna smell like it. Your things are gonna smell like it. When you go to school, the dogs are gonna smell that scent. So now a child who is not using drugs, whose parents are using drugs, will now be identified, targeted, and searched incorrectly because they're not a user they don't have possession, but they will be embarrassed and humiliated to be searched for drugs that they don't have. Now, I, I hear a lot of stories of this has been done in other schools and other schools are doing this, but we're the parents who like to say to our children, if everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you? The fact that everyone has been doing something does not necessarily mean it's okay or that it's the right thing to do. Um, this, this is so terrible, but I'll just read this. And this, these are my words because um, this really upsets me, so I'm just going to read it because I, I probably can't get to say it authentically. Uh, drug sniffing dogs, a.k.a. marijuana sniffing dogs, are only going to criminalize the children of medicinal and recreational marijuana users. If these children live in a home where marijuana is legally consumed, of course they're going to smell like it, and yes, adults will identify them. This whole policy is steeped, and I don't mix my words. This whole policy is steeped in bigotry and, dare I say, racism. It stinks of the war on drugs, which we know disproportionately affected people of color. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't the children of color make up the majority of the public school system student body in Fitchburg? To my knowledge, it's 68% of the school's population. So you tell me what this is about and who this will really impact. Now we are taking the war on drugs to school, criminalizing the children of recreational and medicinal marijuana users. To be clear, I'm not saying that marijuana use is a people of color thing. Not at all. But the repercussions for people of color are different and more far-reaching than our counterparts. 
This is upsetting, to say the least. I would like for those who are responsible for educating our children to see them as people, to see the value in them, and understand this. When we are honest with our kids about drug use, a dog is not going to make a difference. The dogs don't smell the fentanyl, the Percocet, the other drugs. These, when we talk about our family and friends who are dying from drug overdoses, it's not marijuana. That's not what's killing them. So this false security that we're trying to give ourselves and our children based on dogs that can pretty much only sniff out marijuana doesn't make sense to me. It's actually disrespectful to our intelligence as a community. You want to fight the war on drugs, keep educating our children. Don't stigmatize the ones who are there simply to get an education, who happen to live in homes where their parents, recreationally, which is now legal, and medicinally, consume marijuana. I can't support this. I can't believe you're supporting this in 2017. It's scary. It really is. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. I'm Paige Sharon. I live at 139 Mount Vernon Street in Fitchburg. I'm a Crocker parent. I'm on the PTO. I'm on the Special Ed Parent Advisory Committee. And I also interned at Fitchburg High School. I had some interesting uh, conversations there today with Officer Archipetti and also Mr. Kimber, who works in our hallways. And they deal with this issue all the time. I work, um, I intern in the program with the kids with social and emotional behavioral issues. So this is something I've seen firsthand. And as a parent, I oppose it. I want to build on what Michael said a little. I don't think that everybody understands that we don't all live in the same America, that when you have three black sons, you live in a different America. And how you perceive police um, can be different. And I'm very respectful of the police. I like Officer Archipetti very much. I enjoyed getting his opinion today on what he thought of the policy since he would be the person really working with it. But I would like to ask you to consider the possibility that parents of children of color do see this differently. And when we see a police dog, we don't see the same imagery maybe that um, other parents of white children see. It doesn't really me always mean safety and security to us. It, it's kind of scary to us. And I think it could scare some of our children. And I think particularly in the political climate that we're in right now, which we all know what I'm talking about, there's a lot of um, actions going on that are affecting people. And they're worried about their families. They're worried about deportation. They're worried about mom and dad being home when they get home. And, and this is not about this policy, but it is about you know the increased enforcement and the images of dogs in the schools. And you know that people are just very sensitive right now to um, sort of extra police presence. And um, so I think the timing of this is incredibly bad, given some of the things that we're dealing with politically right now and some of the fears that our families are experiencing because of who they are, either as, as people of color or their immigration status. Um, so I build on that. But I also know, too, from what I see at the high school, is that uh, the intent is not to criminalize our children. It's um, being treated as a disciplinary issue. It's a suspension of five or ten days, depending on what's found and whether it's being done at school. Or, and I like that. I think that's the correct way to deal with um, something that's kind of equated now more as alcohol than than drugs with the pot issue in particular, which is what the dogs mostly find. So I think suspension is very appropriate. What I would really like to see, as I told some of you that I emailed, I would love to see the school committee put its energy into treatment and um, thinking about what our schools could be doing when we find kids doing drugs and we suspect that they might be self-medicating and um, or we know from what they tell us that their families have addiction issues or alcoholism issues, I would love to see those resources available in the schools to kids with, um, you know, Al-Anon groups on campus and other treatment options. I would love to see the energy go there uh, because we do have drug problems and our families have drug problems and I would, I've wanted more resources to help with that. So I would ask you to uh, think about that some more as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
Good evening. Good evening. I'm Bill McSheehy. I live at 250 Mount Vernon Street. Um, I'm coming here to speak in favor of the K-9 program. Um, I am a retired principal. I was have retired 12 years ago from Dedham. The Dedham school system and other school systems I worked in also put the K-9 program into their school system as long ago as 14 years ago. Um, I don't want to mislead you that there was discussion too in those school systems as to what kind of disruption it was going to cause. Once it was implemented, I have to agree with Mr. Cragen, there was very little disruption. It was always while the students were in class, the teachers were in class, it lasted 10 to 15 minutes. Um, in the time I was there, that the program was there, it was only two children in the entire time I was there that actually were involved with some situation where they did have drugs in their locker. I think the parent who spoke earlier, um, reading the policy handbook was very effective. It's already a policy. It is a policy in the Fitchburg school system that is on file with the Department of Ed. It is a legal document. You have a code of conduct for students. They are expected to follow that code of conduct. And this is just one other way of enforcing that, the, that your code of conduct is in fact enforced. Um, you know, we, there was a day in our society we didn't have to lock the doors to the schools. Well, guess what we do now? And that isn't to keep the kids inside, it's to keep from outside coming in. This is just one more thing of keeping the outside world out of our high schools and out of our schools. The lockers do not belong to students. They belong to the, the institution of the schools. There is an institution in place. It has institutional rules and regulations. They should be followed. If you can work with the police department, the school system and the police department, working in conjunction together, to protect every kid in that high school, that's our job. That is our job, or your job. Um, and I think the majority of parents, they want you to take good care of their kids, and they expect you to take good care of your kid, their kids. That means keeping all contraband out of the school. That does include grass. Um, I, I understand it's not the only problem, but it is one of the problems. And so I, I, I really don't think you're gonna find the disruption a huge piece. I think. Honestly, most parents, if asked, would like to know that their kids are going to a drug-free school. Um, I know that's your goal, and um, I personally hope that you do pass this, this policy. Um, I do, one other thing is we finally have a high school that is being recognized as one of the finest high schools in the country, in the state. Just keep moving that way. We have a, we have a lot to be proud of, a lot to be proud of. So good luck. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I was planning on just supporting my husband tonight and not saying anything, um, and then realize I should say something, um, just to kind of clarify what addiction looks like. Um, as a substance abuse um, clinician working at Spectrum Health Systems, I encounter um, individuals from our community um, who suffer and struggle with um, addiction every single day, individuals that look just like you and me. Um, so when we talk about a drug-free school system, we have to ask ourselves, what, what's our definition of drug-free? If drug-free is we just don't want to see it, we just don't want to find it, then fine. But is it really helping our children to understand what addiction is? And if that's the case, we're, and if we're rearing children who will become successful adults in our community, then just having a dog going around sniffing um, for um, drugs, we're basically sending the message, just don't have it here, just don't bring it into school, but if you're struggling out there, do what you're doing out there. So can we, if, could we be more preventative in terms of looking at educating our children about what addiction really looks like? Educating our children, um, on how to manage stress. We find that a lot of the people that did start it using, um, it was dealing with stressful environments and they didn't turn to marijuana. They turned to um, Adderall and drugs that were prescribed by doctors. 90% of the clients that I'm dealing with, it was drugs prescribed by pharmaceutical companies, not the ones you can sniff, but the ones that our kids right now are using. 
and we have no idea that they're using them. So how can we help our children by increasing services for um, guidance counselors within our school, making sure that we're properly funded in all our schools for guidance counselors, that they have access to those resources, making sure that we're increasing parent engagement that our parents and those that are struggling in these homes are getting the resources that they need by decreasing the stigma of what um, addiction and also what drug use looks like. And we don't get that by a drug sniffing dog. It's this communication and that collaboration that happens within our community is really, really the work. If we're thinking of a strong community, a stable environment, that's what Fitchburg needs. We need education, we need resources in our school, more mental health professionals in our school, and more, even more mental health professionals when we are having discussion on how we, do, we move forward. Where are those people that we are consulting to really get feedback on how we can be more preventative and, um, and not necessarily reactive. We're coming in after the fact. And also when we look at the war on drugs, how many presidents talked about the war on drugs and increased policing? And did that stop the war on drugs? Right now we have an epidemic on our hands and having the policing did not stop it. We found that the services and being preventative was what really, really is going to decrease uh, our, our concerns about the war on drugs. And also, just lastly, if we really, really think about what addiction looks like, a lot of my clients or who have passed away and also the overdose that's happening in our community um, are from things like fentanyl, things that you cannot smell and if we could ed educate our kids on what these drugs are, what they look like, having healthy self-esteem, building their emotional, that making sure that they are stable and healthy individuals that can go out in our community. I believe that's where, if we really want to fight the war on drugs, that's where we start. Thank you. Thank you. Five minutes? Yes. Yeah. I'll try. My name is Neil Delfeld. I live in Fitchburg. I have two girls in McKay. Um, the important thing to note about the current policy is that it does fall under the uh, legality. It is the canine search, adding a canine search layer to it actually makes it illegal and anti educational. The schools already do not need probable cause to search, just reasonable and articulable suspicion that a violation has occurred. The bag searches, basically. That's in the policy that's listed. But there's a reason that schools do not need as much evidence as police. In some ways, schools administration takes place of parents, but not completely. They're also government officials. Fourth Amendment specifically applies to them where it does not for parents. So there are some requirements that must be met in order to have, uh, to avoid the probable cause requirement. Punishment in school has to be internal, less severe, and less permanent. The schools are under, have to understand that they educate, or they, they are there to educate. They are not there to send troublemakers to the legal system. They are not. They are there to nurture their better nature, not to punish them for their worst. Um, the punish, uh, but, they, but because of these limits on punishment, schools can then search more freely. They can question students more freely, and they can discipline more freely within their own constraints of the school system. And students likewise are assured that their explorations, even into negative and harmful behavior, will not make the school abandon them. Bringing canines into any school automatically escalates the punishment. Canines are there for principals, not the police. They enhance the principal's ability to smell drugs. That's badly worded. Um, they, they enhance the principal's ability to find drugs through the sense. Uh, on a canine's uh, alert, the police, the principal can choose to search the locker or not. The police are not allowed to search. So far, this, may, this is what everybody thinks about when they think about the canine searches, I imagine. Um, what if drugs are found? That gives probable cause. The police can search the student with a dog or without. They can arrest the student. This is the escalation. 
The school search policy tries to deal with this. It asks the police uh, to not let the schools handle, uh, to let the school handle lesser drug possessions, but the police use this as a mere courtesy. It does not remove the right of the police to arrest. If you don't think the police could take advantage of that, I mean, you're not thinking 20 years down the line, 10 years down the line. You're thinking about what's in front of you. And you also have to reflect on U.S. versus Place, the 1983 court case that cut a hole in the Fourth Amendment. This case said the schools don't have to use canines, but they certainly <coughs> are allowed to. And the police, likewise, don't have to arrest students, but they certainly are allowed to. Your policy opens the door, but it has no way of closing it. The police must arrest for something that they view as a serious crime. This holds true even if the principals disagree. In general, this policy focuses on the dogs, not the administration. <coughs> Excuse me. But the principal uh, can, only, can, can rely on reasonable suspicion rather than probable cause only because the possible punishment is internal, far less severe, and le and within, and far less severe than the legal system. Police canines remove internal punishment, escalate the probable cause, I'm sorry, the possible punishment to the level of the legal system. Therefore, schools can only use canines to search if they have prior probable cause. Taking this a step further, random or scheduled drug searches, I'm sorry, canine searches, are not based on probable cause, nor reasonable suspicion. Therefore, schools are not allowed to use canines. But maybe you feel this policy is right, rather than you can prove legally that it is. In New Jersey versus TLO, the court case that established reasonable suspicion for schools, the Supreme Court writes, the individual's interest in privacy and personal security suffers whether the government's motivation is to investigate violations of criminal laws or breaches of statutory or regulatory standards. So the search had better be on point, they follow up to say, which means that a search of a student by a teacher or other school official will be justified at its inception when there are reasonable grounds for suspecting the search will turn up evidence that the student has violated or is violating either law or rules of the school. Reasonable grounds cannot exist in random or scheduled canine searches. Without evidence of the crime, canines do, do affect the innocent students as well as the guilty. You can call it teaching kids a lesson. You can call it influencing the children, sending a message, a tool for law enforcement. Whatever the phrase, it's not educational. It's actually the opposite. You can feel the brutal tool of fear used to make kids obey the rules in these dogs. This policy is anti-educational. This policy is illegal. You have to vote it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any others wishing to offer public comment? Um, this. Well, well, Chief, thank you. Brianna, did you want to speak? Five minutes, Chief. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, I know committee they, members. They um, I would be remiss if I didn't take an opportunity once again come out this evening and publicly support the canine searches in our public schools. Um, I've heard a lot of things said tonight. As I said to the last meeting, I respect all the opinions of, of the people that spoke before me. However, I, I feel it's necessary for me to give my opinion on some of those comments. First of all, there's been talk about cost of canines, bringing them to schools. I need to reiterate, there is no cost to the Fitchburg Public Schools. We bring canines in from other agencies, Mass State Police, or from our local uh, neighboring communities. There's no charge for the use of the canines. They use it as a training day. During these exercises, they take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. I've heard that several times that there's a cost, and I need to reiterate, there is no cost. We use our school resource officers to work with the canines. A couple of other concerns I heard this evening. Um, there was talk about we're, we're looking for drug dealers. What we're looking for is we're looking to keep our schools free of drugs and alcohol. Let's keep in mind, marijuana may be legal if you're over 18, but it's still an illegal substance if you're in high school. There's a lot of talk about the war on the op opiate epidemic. Well, make no mistake about it, no one sees it greater than I do. I re read the reports daily, I see who overdoses, and, and tragically I see who dies from it. A lot of research has gone into the opiate crisis, and the Fitchburg Police Department, I believe, is at the forefront in this battle, and we're, we're attacking it on many different levels. We're not only attacking it on drug interdiction, but we're, we're attacking it at the educational level. I believe if we're ever going to get our, ourselves out of this opiate epidemic, it's going to be through education. It's going to be through education, educating our youth. If you think about it, we've been battling the war on nicotine and smoking for the last 50 years. 
we're not going to get our way, we're not going to work our way out of the opiate epidemic overnight. However, I think it's imperative that we send a message to our student body that the Fitchburg Public Schools are free of drugs and alcohol, and using a canine is just another tool to, to achieve that goal. Several years ago, the school committee adopted to institute school resource officers in our schools. I think it's been an exceptional program. I think our school resource officers have made relationships with our students. We form better trust in our schools. Please keep in mind, a canine is only uh, one tool on that police officer's tool belt. We have many tools, and this is just one other tool to further our mission, mission to make our public schools safe, to have a healthy environment so our students can learn. I hope you can support this initiative. The police department fully supports this initiative. We look further to collaborating with our school committee and, and working close with our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief. Did the principals want to speak? No? Well, we've got. We, we were going to reserve the next comment period for the for the the committee as well as students. Do you want to defer to that, Brian? Brian, you want to uh, say a few words, please? Sure. Um, well, we talked about this for um, a good amount of time this past week in student advisory council, and. Um, I think, I mean, speaking as a current student, just in the most simplistic form, the canine searches are just designed to promote an environment that focuses on learning, that we know no one is immune to drugs, no one is immune to that lifestyle, but when you go to school, that shouldn't go with you. School should be a place where you can learn and you can feel safe and comfortable, and a random 10 to 15 minute canine search while you're in a classroom and the dog is in the hall, that doesn't affect your learning, that doesn't impede on your education. It's just another safety measure that promotes a healthy environment for everyone that wants to learn. And it's not seen as a, an issue from what we've talked about. Thank you. I was going to make a statement, an overview of the new canine search initiative. I'm speaking as the chair. The Fitchburg Public School District has been looking at introducing canine searches for over a year. What, that's, what that is intended to do is to tell you how thoroughly it's been vetted. This has been as a response to interest on the part of Fitchburg High School and the Fitchburg Police Department for inclusion of this initiative as another tool for keeping students safe. It is understood that this practice alone does not end drug possession or use, but is a valuable tool in raising awareness and prevention. This has received review from, the, from both the Student Support Subcommittee, as just stated, as well as the Policy Subcommittee, which has developed a new search policy. Most of the surrounding communities have had canine searches for many years. These will occur, only occur at middle schools and high schools and the high school. Searches are only of hallways and lockers while all students are in their classrooms. Students will not be searched by canine search dogs. The excellent relationship building and preventative work of the staff and resource officers will continue and ideally be expanded. There will be no cost to the district for this program, as the chief mentioned. This initiative is not about arresting students. Our resource officers are already, already work very closely with school officials daily on a variety of issues, and arrests are not the goal and rarely the outcome. Thank you. I think the uh, chair, you wish to uh, read a statement, I believe? Yes, uh, I would like to read a statement. This is um, from uh, Counselor at Large, Marcus Di Natale, who could not be here tonight. Um, and he wrote this uh, yesterday morning. So he said, I would, uh, good morning, school committee members. I would like to commend and support the efforts of the Fitchburg School Committee in developing a policy aimed at suspected illegal drug activity in our schools. Tomorrow, I urge your affirmative votes to institute this new policy. I have spent some time researching this hot button issue as there are legitimate concerns some may have regarding protections under the Fourth Amendment. There are several cases in federal district and appellate courts that deal with this. Many cases resulted in the school district policies being upheld with a a few ruling the opposite. The matter has yet to reach the Supreme Court. I happen to side with the federal district and appellate courts that rule to uphold these policies. One example is Burleson versus Springfield Public Schools. 
The three-judge panel of the U.S. Supreme, uh, of, excuse me, the U.S. Court of Appeals, Eighth Circuit, ruled that the Fourth Amendment was not being violated as a result of these searches and seizures in March of 2011. It concluded that, quote, the seizure was part of a reasonable procedure to maintain the safety and security of students at the school, close quote. The Eighth Circuit further ruled that students have a lesser expectation of privacy than the general public, for example, if authorities were to enter one's home. This is one such example. The opponents of this measure are falsely spreading, prop spreading propaganda on social media that this A, costs the district money it does not have, and B, that students will be pulled from classrooms and searched themselves by dogs. Both obviously are false. Since I am, uh, am unable to attend tomorrow night's meeting, I wanted to relay to you by support of this, my support of this measure and urge your passage. Thank you, Councillor at Large, Marcus Di Natale, Chairman of the Finance Committee, Member of the Legislative Affairs Committee. Ms. LaBelle Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, first of all, I just want to say that I'm really grateful that it was tabled last week because I have wanted to speak on this and I, I definitely want to vote on this measure. Um, I had to leave unexpectedly last week, and I apologize. But in the interim, I think um, we have a better policy, in part because, I, you know, we are listening to the things that people say. And there isn't a single person on this committee who hasn't spent a lot of time thinking about what the right thing to do here is. And I know I've met with Mr. Delfeld um, on a couple of occasions this past year, and we've heard each other out. I don't, I know we haven't convinced each other, um, but the things that you've said and the things that Mr. Maxwell said are things that I'm sure are gonna, going to end up um, as discussions um, should this pass in student support subcommittee meetings, which, by the way, in the student support subcommittee uh, meetings, all the things that um, that other people have spoken about tonight, addiction, social emotional support, depression, how to deal with signs of suicide, all of these things have come up um, and we have been investigating the best kinds of drug education programs that we can. We all are aware of the uh, multitude of problems and anxieties facing our kids and we are united to deal with those as well. It's not like we think this policy is the panacea for everything. We know you have to hit this issue from so many um, angles. And I, I think our schools are doing it. And, and uh, if you come to those subcommittee meetings, I think you'll see that we are united on that venture. So I don't want people to feel like we're dismissing that. Um, but I do want to add that I have my own experience to draw from with this policy. I have worked in a system that has used canine searches for the last decade. Um, I can tell you that students do not come into contact with dogs. Um, sometimes you don't even know the dogs are there. Um, class continues. Um, and I will say, if anything, it's led to more interesting discussions. You say it has no educational merit. It's led to more interesting discussions in my law and government class as we're able to talk about civil liberties and students' rights and individual rights compared to the rights of all and the need to ensure a safe school. The school, the courts have recognized that school is a different case. Um, students are underage. <clears throat> Administrators have the most vital job of keeping our children safe. The canine searches in my school have not led to a police state, as some people said on social media. They've not led to the criminalization of students. In some cases, they have led to conversations, and in others, they've led to an administrator search. Um, but I'll say this, if they cause one student pause and a second thought to think it's not smart for me to bring drugs or think I can deal drugs at a school or keep them in my car, um, then I think this policy has done its job. It's one tool. Every other piece that you mentioned is, of course, something that our school committee considers um, on a weekly basis um, and that our schools are working on on a daily basis. But I think we have to be emphatic that drugs are not allowed in schools. And this is just another tool to help get that message out. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment from the committee? I have a statement of my own. Oh, yes, Robert. Okay. Um, I'd just like to make my own statement. Um, since last week when we had the first reading, uh, the school committee's uh, pub uh, policy committee, subcommittee, actually went back and modified this, the uh, search policy. 
Uh, we made clear that canine searches will be conducted only of lockers, not individual students, and such searches will be limited to grade five and above. The policy <coughs> provides that uh, these searches will be coordinated to minis minimize disruption. So most likely students are going to be in their classrooms when these searches are taking place. Um, last, all students will have knowledge of this policy and therefore the possibility of such a search beforehand. They'll know that this is coming. Um, if the search of the lockers results in finding illegal substances, school officials and administrators then may conduct a search of the student's person, uh, but only then will that happen. Um, one parent expressed concern that um, searches might be used to discriminate against specific students. If a canine search is conducted of lockers, neither the canine nor the police officer who's um, handling the, the uh, animal will know that any individual locker belongs to any particular student. So the likelihood of discriminating against a particular student or group of students is remote. Some residents have expressed that only one or a few students might be bringing drugs to school. And I guess my question is, how many do you have to have before it's too, much, too many? And I think one is too many. Um, the Fitchburg Public Schools has a compelling interest in protecting all of its students from illegal drugs and illegal substances. Um, students do have a, a decreased expectation of privacy in lockers owned by the school system. And the periodic search of lockers by school administrators and or canines that are specifically trained to detect illegal drugs or illegal substances is minimally intrusive. Such searches, we believe, will act as an effective deterrent to those students who might think about bringing illegal substances to school. In light of the foregoing, I believe that searches conducted in accordance with this policy would be considered reasonable in light of not only the Fourth Amendment, but Article 14 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Any further questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, recommend that we take student search policy 5718 out of order. That would be taking action item 17-820 out of order. I have a motion. Motion. Second. Did the principals want to speak? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, members. Yeah. Uh, did the principals want to speak? I, I, I can certainly speak to this, Mayor, and I appreciate the Thank you. Um, Jeremy Roach, Principal of Fitchburg High School. Good to hear. I appreciate the conversation that's going on from the public comments and also the school committee. <clears throat> As a high school principal, I feel it's very important and uh, probably the most important aspect of my job is making sure that we have a safe and secure environment. And I see this as just, I, I've heard someone refer to it as a, another tool to ensure that as much as possible. Um, I can assure the community that our focus at Fitchburg High School is to maintain a positive academic, extracurricular, social environment. And in dealing with the issues that do arise, whether it's a bullying incident or a drug issue or whatever, that, that we look to the school rules to address those. And we do not look to immediately uh, have students, you know, arrested or work with in, in that type of scenario. We, we look to try to address it as a school matter and do that in, in a way that reinforces the rules of the school, but also in certain instances where it's appropriate, try to provide additional resources to the student, whether that's counseling or whatever. So I have had experience previously in another district with the canine searches. The other upshot of it from my perspective is it's brief, it's 10 to 20 minutes or thereabouts. It does provide us another opportunity to practice sort of the shelter in place, you know, procedure that's part of, <clears throat> we've moved from straight lockdown to more of an Alice, um, you know, process for how we secure our facility. And I know Alice has been discussed here at school committee, so I won't get into that, but I do see it as sort of allowing us another quick opportunity to do that too just so people are familiar with it. So when we do an announcement to that effect, everyone in our facility, and at any one time, you know, we're 1,300 plus different individuals in the building, you know, it gives us that chance as well. So again, we don't look at, at individuals who use drugs or possess drugs as criminals, but we do need to send the message. I, I firmly believe that school is not a place for that. 
And then if you want help, our hand is always there to, to reach out, you know, to, to accept your hand if you're asking for help. But if there's a situation where, where you're bringing drugs in and or, you know, worst case scenario, selling drugs, then there are potential consequences for that. And I, and I really feel honestly that the vast majority of students and faculty feel, feel that same way. You know, they don't want to have to deal with that type of scenario in the school and they want a safe environment. And that does include an environment that's free from having to deal with the issue of drugs on a daily basis. So I appreciate the opportunity to address this. I appreciate the consideration. And, and again, I, I heard some of the oppositional viewpoints and I respect those greatly as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roach. <clears throat> Not sure. I just, I'm, I'm just curious, and I, I guess this might be a question for the students too. If there was a high school student wide vote on whether or not this policy would make students feel safe, do you think that's, that, that it would be a majority of students that would say that it would? Yeah, Honestly. Yeah, it's a hypothetical. Well, why does, why, well, we'll vote. Anyway. Hmm. I would defer to the committee about whether or not to address that. I, I don't. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Craig Shalafo, principal at Longeau Middle School, 25 year veteran of Fitchburg Public Schools. I, much like uh, Mr. Roach, has stated that this is obviously a very important conversation for us to have, and I think that. Many of us this evening and over the last few weeks have had some really important points in, uh, to discuss. As a middle school principal, we also have to consider the continuum of decision making along with the growth. Uh, we know that our children are through the formative years are making some critical decisions. They have to put up with, um, with peer pressure, experimentation, curiosity, lots of things go through the minds of children between the ages of, of 12 and 14. And I think if this policy provides us with another deterrent, uh, another conversation for us to have, because ultimately, as Mr. Roach stated, our job is to provide a safe and supportive community for our children to, to learn in and to grow within. And I think part of that is having that conversation with students. And I know that at Long Joe, we do that. We will sit during our advisories and have uh, uh, conversations with children of why something is happening, the importance of it, and really putting that on the table. And, and I think the burden for us, too, is to build those very strong relationships with our families so that we can all kind of come together in this very important uh, era around the use of drugs, how we can keep them out of our schools, keep our schools safe, but most importantly, educate our children about making good decisions. And if it does save one person from making the decision of not using something or not bringing something to school, then I think this policy would be a big win. Thank you, Mr. Schalvo. Thank you. Returning to your motion, Mr. Stevens. Did, did you want to, friend, did you want to say something? Please. I'll go at the same time. So okay. All right. Great. Right. Mine up. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to um, try to speak in measured terms and tones because I greatly respect the people who have spoken here in opposition to this. And um, as most of you know, I have been the only African-American administrator in this district for close to 15, maybe 20 years. It's my 18th year as principal. So when people speak about the images of dogs in law and order and what that constitutes, I, I just want you to know that as an undergrad at UMass, I had a picture of Huey Newton <laughs> holding a rifle on my wall. I was there in 1968. Well, I wasn't there, but I was in the middle of when John Carlos and Tommy Smith held their black glove. I was the one that brought the Black is Beautiful binder to school um, and demanded that we had equal access to things. So I am very sensitive to issues around discrimination in people of color. I just want to say that I think this is a deterrent similar to surveillance cameras. Um, there is no one that cares more about their students than I do in their well-being. The first thing I say to any student the first day of school is 
find an adult to help you if you have an issue. If you bring something to the school by mistake, find an adult. We will take care of it. There will be no punishment. We will handle it. Okay? If this comes out to be disproportionately negatively impacting students of color, I will be the first one before you to say we've got to fix this. Yeah. Okay? But this is just one tool. Um, we have done this in, in the past as a demonstration, and I can tell you I had a student come up to me and say, Mr. Thomas, I made a mistake. I have something in my locker before this happens. I met with him, called his mom. We took care of it. There was no issue whatsoever. Right? So I think that yeah, I am very, very much aware of the differences in how people view things. Um, in the midst of this current political climate, as you know, at this school we have the ESL students and newcomers. I, I, I can tell you that this Trump phenomenon has raised anxiety levels greatly. So I am very, very sensitive to what images mean. This has to be a rollout of not just the dogs are coming. There has to be a lot of conversations, and that's what we intend on doing. Um, to this, ladies, I'm sorry, I forgot your first name, but we have um, at our school we have six external counselors that come in to deal with this, as well as two guidance counselors and school adjustment counselors that are running lunch groups and things that you say Al Anon groups, things like this. This is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, it, it may raise anxieties initially. I think that it's something that, it, again, it's going to have to be. Um, discussed. People are going to have to be reassured. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know about a vote, but I think, as someone had said earlier, in the few instances when someone has brought something to school that didn't belong here, I would say 98, maybe 99 percent of the time, it's a student who tells me that they brought it. So they don't want this stuff in the school either. Okay? Um, there is potentially a danger of someone saying, why are you treating us all like criminals? And that has to be part of the discussion. It's similar to the surveillance cameras that we have in the schools and on the buses. We're not treating you like criminals. We're trying to protect you. But it's the, the idea that um, we're trying to arrest kids or I ship them out to school. That's not what the, the object of this is, and that's not what I will do if, if, a, a, if a locker is targeted here, regardless of who it may belong to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. <coughs> Ray Dewar, Goodrich Academy. Um, I've been in the Worcester Public Schools, and I've been principal of two other schools where um, searches were done. And I think this policy is the least intrusive of any of the policy I've, <coughs> policies that I've seen, and I applaud you for that because um, I think in other cases where um, – dogs have been brought into classrooms that the students have then vacated. That's been very obtrusive and, uh, and embarrassing to those students, and, and I think that, that, that those were wrong. Um, I th and I think also, without counseling, without education, the policy won't work, um, and nothing's going to happen in terms of uh, trying to address the drug issue. But we have to do something, and I think with education, with counseling, with trying to find ways to give students pause. It's another thing that we can do. And I think we have to do everything that we can do as opposed to say, well, what about this, what about that? It's, it's a matter of let's try to make schools as safe as possible and let's try to make people aware that if they make the wrong choice, then there are going to be consequences. And if it does give them pause, <laughs> then we're in way better shape. So um, I do support the policy. Thank you, Mr. Doerr. Thank you. Superintendent. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we consistently say to our principals and staff is, tell us what you need. What, what do you need to do your job? What do you need for us to do at your level as the school committee and at our level at central office? This request comes out of our schools. It comes out of our administrations. And it comes out of our police department, who are part of our school system with the resource officers. Um, I couldn't say anything better than what the principals have said. And you know how I operate. I've been operating in a certain way for a long time, and that is that I always look the closest to the people who are working in the classroom, <coughs> working in the schools, and say, what's it like for you? What would work best for you? Not from central office, but what would work best for you in the classroom? Um, and I was glad to hear 
the reference to all of the other supports. This is only one tool, and, and it's been an opportunity for us to educate the community of what goes on in our schools all the time in terms of supports that we give. Uh, I know that we've had Chris Heron here at least twice. Recently in the fall, Chris Heron is the former basketball player who just a few decisions on his part that seemed so innocent at the time totally destroyed his potential for a, a professional basketball uh, career. So, it, so these things that seem like little opportunities or just happenstance at a particular time in school can have repercussions in long term. Um, everything that you decide on, every policy you've ever decided on in the 12 years I've been here have had two sides to the policy and it puts you in a very difficult decision. But I feel one of the things I've also seen here in the last 12 years is that whoever the body is that's sitting there, they're always very deliberate. They always try to make sure that what they're doing is having the best impact in the classroom and, re and providing the best either social environment, academic environment, or even facility environment for our, our uh, students. So um, you've heard the support that you have from the people that are on the front line actually doing the work. And I just wanted to add that that's only one thing that we do, but every day all of the staff in the school are doing many of the things that were brought up here by other people as things that need to be done if we're going to have a really healthy school environment. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Has everyone spoken who wishes to speak? Yes. Sheila. I just didn't know even, I, I, it's been a while since I actually presented at the committee, so I didn't know if I was out of turn or. You're fine. You're fine. So I walked in here, I had very little idea of what was happening, saw Pesha outside, I have friends like him that I know, and it's so tough to speak on an issue that's so divided. But um, for the past four years, my older son goes to Longstreet Middle School, and I have seen your name and address. Oh, that's all right. That's okay. <laughs> Just kind of quick. Sheila and uh, Sheila Thelmraju. My address is 69 Balada Way Thank in Fitchburg. You. I have two children that go to the public schools, and Sorry, that's all right. And I have been um, going to the public schools every day to drop lunch for my children because of their severe special needs. So I go to Longstreet every day. I, for the past four years, I've been going, and I see all the wonderful things that Mr. Shalafo does. I see the diversity there. I see the special needs children. I see social-emotional classrooms there that he supports, and I completely respect the work and the place that they come from, whether it's Mr. Roach, my son's going to the high school next year. I feel like, like Mr. Ravenel said, that they're in the front every day, and being a parent, I would support whatever... They, uh, their perspective is because just hearing Mr. Thomas speak was just so moving to me because it is a situation where with people being um, so uh, afraid of whatever is happening, whether it's the Trump administration, what, but hearing him speak, hearing Mr. Roach speak, um, hearing uh, Mr. Shalfo speak, and our police chief who's, you know, who's purpose is to protect and serve, they're all supporting this policy, and I feel as a parent that I would support whatever they would support because they're in the front lines every day. So I, I hope I was helpful. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you to the, the principals. I have a lot of respect for them, and they know it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Again, all who wishing, wish to speak have spoken. Want to revisit that motion? We've, we've, we've made the motion from second, second to vote to take it out of order. Take 17-820 out of order, student search policy 5718. Take the motion. We, 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 we need a vote. We need a vote to take it out? Yes. 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 Oh. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Seeing none, it is before you. I will make the motion for 1720-1617 to approve the superintendent's recommendation, recommendation to approve the second reading of the student search policy. Second. Okay. All in favor, can we have a show of hands, please? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Superintendent, you want to take the next section? Yes. Uh, just a couple of... Um, 
communications, and I wanted to piggyback one of the communications of our two students because I did not want it lost in the shuffle of their, uh, of their announcements, and that is the ocean science team. Uh, some of you remember, we haven't always had an ocean science team. I want to say it's third year? Um, third or fourth? Fourth. So this is the fourth year, and remember the first time, uh, Doug Grant, who's one of our teachers at the high school, the kids said, we want to do this. And he said, let's just go and help for the first year. And they just went and kind of helped run it. Then they competed the second year and came back with a participation award or some trophy that they showed us. And this is their fourth year. And I want it said that being sixth place at this is not an easy task. And I don't usually do this, but I will name some of the districts that our students at Fitchburg High School beat. <laughs> Acton Boxborough High School, Lexington High School, and Brookline High School, among others. Boston Latin. Boston Latin. <laughs> so let it be said that when someone says that Fitchburg High School, as uh, Mr. Sheehy said, is right up there, ready to compete, toe-to-toe -to -toe in any kind of a competition, I didn't want that to be missed. So congratulations to Doug Grant, who, who really inspires these students and, and gets them going and for the wonderful work that they did. And I also wanted to just give you a little bit of an update. We're continuing to work on Footsteps to Brilliant and the rollout of that. And Kathy Brady today just gave me a little bit of an update on what's been going on before we get to the big rollout, which will be in May. We now have 115 community users, so not our preschools, but out there in the community who are starting to begin to, to use this. And, and for ourselves, since mid-January, 220 of our own preschoolers in, the, in Fitchburg have used this and have been exposed to 2,676,632 words wow. since mid-January. One more time. What's that? One, <laughs> how many, how many, number one more time again. 2,676,632 uh, words that they've been exposed to since mid-January. And you know our conversation about this is a paucity of vocabulary yep. and that 40 million word uh, gap. And then they also have read 11,949 books and they have practiced literacy skills 7,621 times. And we're still in basically the beginning of implementation. So I think that this bodes really, really well and the enthusiasm that we're finding around the classroom and around people for this, uh, this is going to really make if, a difference. If I, if I could. Yeah. The, um, Kathy, um, Eva Kelly, and I plan to go to the United Neighbors um, dinner next Tuesday night, and we're going to set up a, a display and sign parents up uh, for Footsteps Thanks. to Brilliance as well. So we can, we're, we're already gone to three agency meetings, and so our mission is to get the word out into the community. And um, related to, so for people out there, our gala is coming. It's May 6th, and that gala is going to be for raising uh, funds for after-school programs and for some targeted funds for Footsteps to Brilliance. And organizations that have uh, students, like we've, we know that the Catholic schools in Fitchburg, I've reached out to them. If they buy a table of 10, uh, for 10 people at $50 a piece, that's a $500 table, and $200 will go towards the price of the meal, and their $300 will be for them to purchase devices for their school to give wow. students access. So we're just starting to roll this out, but that's part of the goal, is that it's, it's sponsored, it's funded, and it's being rolled out by the Fitchburg Public Schools, but this is a community literacy initiative. Anyone interested in a ticket, call central <laughs> office. Uh, we're going to do a big picture overview of the FY18 budget. I'll turn it over to Bob. Could I, could I just say something? Mr. Mayor, before we start, Bob, because I guess it, you were you made me think about it um, 
as you mentioned, you did a little name dropping there of some other school districts, but I, um, I Assistant Superintendent Chiaquinto, I have to say I was at an event with you at some event this past year where you said something that was just really, I mean, the kind of thing that parents in this district I think really want to hear. You said we have to be as good as the Newtons and the Wellesleys, mm -hmm. and we're not in it to compete for bottom. We're in it to compete for top. And I really, really appreciate that. And I do see that in the initiatives that we pursue in this district. And I, I just want to thank you for that. And as we beat some of those other <laughs> districts, <laughs> um, you know, the, the proof is kind of in the pudding that that's what we're aiming for. So I just, I'm sorry. I, sorry, Bob. <laughs> thank you. It's okay. So uh, I'm going to give everybody just an update on what's already happened and the uh, the current status. Uh, as you know, the governor announced his uh, budget back at, in the middle of January. And just to highlight a, a few uh, points of interest from that, our enrollment has increased by 111 students to 5,757 as of October 1, 2016. Uh, the corresponding Chapter 70 funding increase is just about $2.3 million. Our projected average per pupil expense increased by 1.7 or 1.6 percent from 11,401 to 11,582. And the House and Senate versions uh, may impact funding amount, uh, I guess, if you just use you know, recent history as a guide. That hasn't happened, uh, but the legislature may uh, either approve or reject certain line items that fund certain education initiatives that we rely on for funding. So it's kind of a wait and see what happens on some of those grants. So in terms of where we're at today, um, we do not have a, uh, a direct spending budget at this time. Uh, I am speaking with the city finance folks uh, about that. Um, the city is involved with negotiations surrounding health insurance with its, the various unions, uh, but it should be clear that this will most likely have a, some type of negative impact on the school department direct spend budget. I, mean, I don't think I'm speaking out of school, no pun intended, but health insurance is increasing, um, you know, and whether or not it's any of this increases surrounding this, uh, the whatever, replacement or repeal of the Affordable Care Act, um, you know, just from what little information I've been given or guidance, um, <coughs> there is no flat or decreasing scenario for, for, for us, okay? Um, the school department is waiting for final funding of grants for next year, uh, which with the passage of the Ever Student Succeeds Act may also negatively impact FY18 funding. Uh, we continue to monitor enrollment trends and needs of students, which also have an adverse impact on FY18 funding. One example of this is the transportation of students in foster care. Uh, we just had a conversation today with DESC Finance. They're meeting with the Department of Children and Families on Wednesday to see how this will uh, play out financially at the state level. And I guess w based on that meeting, they may approach the legislature about trying to fund find some funding for that. Um, but as um, Jay Sullivan said today, the state doesn't have enough money to fund a lot of its mandates, and the state doesn't certainly have enough money to fund federal mandates, of which this is one. Um, the cabinet will be meeting this week to discuss our priorities given the potential funding landscape. Um, where we have kind of a, a high and low range that we'll be looking at and really waiting to hear from the city after um, there's some type of agreement on the health insurance uh, as to what our direct spending budget will be. Um, you know, we were, we plan to hold a resource subcommittee meeting last Thursday, the day of uh, Windzilla, I'll call it. <laughs> and uh, we're going to try to reschedule that meeting at some point in the very near future. Um, and I guess, I guess lastly, uh, it's, it really is too early to tell what changes will occur at the federal level with the new edu education secretary leader. So, questions? Well, well, there's been a House bill introduced that's pretty frightening <laughs> for introducing vouchers and backtracking on school nutrition. And I guess that's one question that I have about what will happen 
um, in terms of that federal grant and school meals for students. I don't know if you know at this point. I mean, nobody it's, can know. Yeah, no details. No, no. I, I was just at a conference, and I have to tell you, um, it was uh, superintendents from across the country, and everyone is terrified. Yeah. Um, from a public school point of view, there is no good news coming out of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. that's, that's as plain as I can make it, that pretty much everything that they're hearing is really um, about taking away from the existing public schools. Would There's, we potentially be in a position where we are not part of that grant any this coming year? Is that you which mean grant? The, the eligibility? Year? Yeah, yeah. For this year, for, this current year, or next year? For next year. I I, I don't know. Gene. Okay. Um, it's too early to tell. Okay. And really, until the federal budget comes out, you know, there's there's a lot of spin. Okay. There's a lot of talk. Um, no one's sure, but the, the director of AASA met with the new Secretary of Education uh, and did not walk away with encouraging news for the rest of us. And for the first time, I went to a conference where the tone was really very aggressive as opposed to very celebratory and aspirational about what public education can do. The whole tone of the conference was how are we going to do the work that we need to do with some of the directions, you know, that are right now coming out of Washington. So, um, you know, tune in. Uh, but there's, um, and, and, you know, for Massachusetts and for a lot of other states, there was a lot of, a lot of the concern was there's a real feeling that we've been on an upward climb, that we've, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, we've really been making progress and, you know, school districts have been making change and implementing the kinds of things that are reaching out to graduation rates, dropout rates, and all the things that were part of our charge and that a reduction in that could, could halt that progress at a time when we're being told by the business community, you're not, our, our students are not prepared enough. You need to do this and this and this and this and this. Um, that's going to be difficult to accomplish with a reduction in uh, resources. And if students are hungry, they're going to have a harder time uh, studying. So um, there, there's a lot out there that's still unknown. But the positive part of it is there are a lot of people paying attention. That, that's what I came away from is that there really were, everyone is really focused on what is going to be needed in public education? How do you advocate for the work that we need to do? Because there are school committees like you across the country in small towns and big cities all looking at the same thing. There's a, a couple of donations to receive. Uh, there's a $500 donation from Burke Enterprises, and it's specifically related to something that our two students mentioned, and it's to provide incentives for student attendance. So uh, thank you to Burke Enterprises for $500 to help um, encourage good student attendance. And then there's $7,500 from Digital Credit Union, and that is to be used in the form of scholarships of $1,000 to $1,500 for the class of 2017. So again, thank you to Digital Federal Credit Union um, and Andre. for all of our community partners who support us. Uh, how are you going to handle that? How are you going to do Goes selection? To the, high, the high school has a whole okay. system in place, and All right. this basically goes there, and the system's been in place for many years. Okay. So it'll be done at the high school level. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, there are grants to, that are uh, being recommended and grants that are being accepted. The grants being recommended is the District School Assistance Grant, or the DSAC grant, for $107,862. Uh, the United Community Foundations grant for $30,000. Um, and then the grants that you are accepting are the Mass Life Sciences Centers grants. That's the one that uh, we just accepted at Mount Wachusett. Great event for $105,345. And that's an awarded competitive funding grant for equipment for STEM labs at Goodrich Academy. We're also receiving the Mass Insight Grant for $39,000, $39,600. Mass Insight is the partnership that we've had for uh, the MIMSI, the AP grant. We're now in another collaboration with them 
of college and career readiness starting at middle school to high school. And this is $40,000 that's being given mostly for students, for teachers to come together and create um, vertical uh, curriculum, looking at, at the curriculum in a vertical way, uh, math curriculum. And technology grant for $8,000 $8, and it will fund the Clean Energy Day for fourth grade <coughs> students at Rheingold on April 5th. So can I just add? Yep. So, Mr. Mayor, if you can keep April 5th open for the event. April 5th. Okay. Got it. It's, right. it's connected to the, the solar, solar panels. panels. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Kind of our ribbon right. cutting. Oh. Right. Okay. It's a big It's up PR. on the roof, Mayor. The yeah. ribbon cutting, right? So. <laughs> I'm, in. Yeah, I'm in. No wind. Yeah. No I'll wind that day. Put a blindfold on me. That's yeah. right. <laughs> When are you, what time? I don't know. Uh, what time know, is it? We don't know the time Nothing yet. Yeah, okay. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll Just pencil in April 5th. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. Got it. We all set, uh, the Superintendent? You want to yep. take up these action items? Action item 17-819, excluding 17-820. 22, 23, 24, and 25. I hear a motion. There's a motion. Okay. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? It's unanimous. Make a motion. Pay the bill. Second. All right. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No need for executive session. I have a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.